There are times when good things happen to bad engineers. After blowing up my vintage Soviet-era flash tube in the last riveting installment of the Laser Saga, I stumbled across this on eBay. This is an American-made xenon laser flash tube circa 2008, and it was a score. Almost the exact same size and shape as the old one, just with a modern design and an English datasheet. My laser rod, on the other hand, also Soviet-era, also eBay, aside from a few scratches, seemed to have survived the explosion intact. This rod is really nothing more than a piece of glass that has been seasoned, or doped to use a technical term, with a pinch of neodymium ions giving it its lasing properties. And as luck would have it, not long after I posted the first laser video, a kind viewer sent me a detailed datasheet with information about this old Russian laser glass. With real datasheets in hand for both the lamp and the rod, I could finally make a serious effort to really understand the math behind the source of my past laser woes the pulse-forming network. The laser rod is like a hill. At first, all the ions are at the bottom of the hill, but if you're willing to expend some energy, in this case a massive pulse of light from a flash tube, you can move them to the top. And with some cleverly placed mirrors, and some quantum mechanical f***ery, you can form the energy they give off when they fall back down the hill into a coherent beam of photons all traveling in the same direction, and all with the same wavelength. A laser beam. The pulse-forming network is just the name given to the circuit that drives the flash tube. It consists of the tube itself, a bank of capacitors to store energy, and an inductor. Pretty simple. But the devil is in the details, and designing this seemingly simple circuit is what really made this project bleed. The length of the pulse, the amount of energy delivered to the flash tube, the current density of the plasma inside the flash tube, the damping factor of the LC circuit, all these parameters are connected. You can't just change one without changing all the other ones. So it becomes a balancing act, tweaking the things you can control to get all the critical values within an acceptable range. once I understood these parameters, and was working with numbers that I could trust, everything fell into place. Really all I needed to do to fix my circuit was increase the voltage on the cap bank and increase the amount of inductance. To deal with the voltage, I sniped four more of these polymer film caps off eBay and wired two parallel strings in series to double the rated voltage and keep the same amount of capacitance. For the inductor, I went with a size-efficient wound ferrite toroid, which puts my final specs at 580 microfarads at 1100 volts with a 50 microhenry series inductor giving me a 420, I promise that's just how the numbers worked out, joule critically damped pulse in 450 microseconds with a peak current density of 4000 amps per square centimeter. The perfect recipe for a working laser. I replaced the electrophoresis power supply I was using to charge the capacitors with an old-school neon sine transformer and a single high-voltage diode as a rectifier, hooked up to a variac to control the output voltage. This is probably the most cost-effective, though certainly not the safest, cap charger if you need voltages in the single-digit kilovolt range. I also added this high-voltage panel meter, complete with a bag of garbanzo beans to keep it from tipping over. If this cap bank was connected across the flash lamp as it is, nothing would happen. The 1100 volts across the caps is not enough to overcome the massive resistance between the two electrodes. So the lamp needs a trigger pulse of around 30,000 volts to strike a low resistance arc across it. Then the main cap bank can dump its energy through this newly formed pathway resulting in a flash. The circuit for the trigger pulse is a 300 volt capacitor and a thyristor that discharges it across a car ignition coil to boost the voltage up to 30 kV. The trigger pulse is delivered to the lamp via a thin nickel wire wrapped around the outside. The voltage is high enough that the arc just couples through the glass. And this brings us to the last major change to the laser assembly. A tapped hole in the side of the pump chamber to accept a through drilled nylon bolt. This ensured the trigger wire was insulated from the aluminum housing, solving the arcing problem I was having before. Because this is high voltage, and fuck you, everything's a wire. Side note here, the shape of the pump chamber is not arbitrary. It is an ellipse with the lamp on one foci and the rod on the other. 
CNC machined out of aluminum and polished to a mere finish, any photon leaving the lamp will bounce off the wall and go straight back into the rod. You can even see this, an object placed down the chamber will form a perfect image right where the other foci is. Pretty cool. Calm down. It's just photons. Well, okay, it's pretty exciting. What I'm looking at here is a product called Zappet Paper, which has a special coating designed to absorb and leave an impression of the output beam of pulsed lasers like this one. That barely noticeable mark served as undeniable proof that there were coherent photons coming out of my laser, and more importantly gave me the confidence and motivation that I was on the right track. The reason the mark was so faint is because the optics in the laser were not aligned very well. This laser uses a plain parallel optical resonator, which, while inexpensive and easy to design, is very finicky and air intolerant, unlike other designs which are much more forgiving. This incomplete circle is about how good the alignment ever got. I'm also fighting with a rather imprecise setup here. Ideally, these mirror mounts would be equatorial, and I would also have a way to adjust the rod. I mean, ideally, ideally, this would all be done on a 3 ton steel optics bench, not a plastic beer pong table sitting in my living room. So, given the circumstances, I'm pretty happy with these results. With the beam aligned-ish, I could add a lens to the equation and put something at the focal point. Starting with the canonical homebrew laser benchmark, a carbon steel razor blade. Which this laser had no trouble vaporizing a hole right through. It's kind of cool how anticlimactic this is. The hole is so small and precise that it's almost hard to see. And I really can't think of another way to make a hole this small in a material this hard. Not that this project is begging for a practical application, but there you go. The razor blade was pretty much the thickest metal this laser could burn through. Coins, a butter knife, and a steel washer all got a nice burn mark, but nothing close to a hole. I was curious to see what would happen if you stuck your hand in the beam, so I zapped some thawed shrimp, which we all know is a perfect analog for human skin, and... Meh, no visible damage with either the focused or unfocused beam, but I'm going to call the test inconclusive and just avoid sticking my fingers in it. One thing the laser would do some damage to is your eye. Throughout this project, I've been using a pair of laser safety goggles tuned to the output wavelength of this laser. Ladies. But I wanted to see if they would have actually saved my vision. The focus beam does a number on the lens, but it doesn't make it all the way through, and there are no marks on the zappet paper behind it from either the focused or unfocused beam. So, yeah, it was probably fun. There are certainly more experiments that could be run with this laser. Different output couplers, cue switching, etc. But I'm declaring victory and shelving it for now. There never really was an end goal or purpose for this project, other than to explore the science. And explore I certainly did. This was a hell of a project and a lot of fun. I think lasers in general stand at a fascinating inflection point in the road of our understanding of the universe, relying on concepts as established and codified as basic 2D geometry to one still in the incubator of scientific debate like our understanding of the quantum interactions that make stimulated emission and thus lasing possible. And on that note, if there's someone out there with an idea for a project thinking, damn, if only I had a pulsed ND glass laser laying around, this would be the coolest thing, hey, let's get in touch. And take it easy. <laughs>